So welcome. We are now in this beautiful light energy of the fall equinox. Yay! <laughs> I'm so ready for it to drop about 20 degrees. So if you have not seen right outside of our sanctuary, the children are really busy making scarecrows, witch crows, festival things. Go out there and have your picture made. They're working really, really hard on this. I hope everybody got one of these little slips of paper when you came in. We are beginning our fall series next week, not this upcoming week, the following week. And so today we're going to set an intention. I'm going to take you through a meditation. And as you're coming out, I'm going to invite you to look at this and write down what is true for you on your heart. If you'd like to give it back to me when the basket comes around or put it at the bookstore, I'd like to see your responses. If this calls to you that you want to take it home because you want to set your intention and remind yourself, you can do that as well. But I'd you don't have to put your name on it, or you can. Either way is fine. But I'd like to see, as we are entering our final dominion of pattern interrupt us, what you're ready to let go of what you're really, truly ready to let go of so that you can create that new, new fall and winter and for next year. And Unity says, many paths, one God. And this fits really well with what I'm talking about today. So I'm going to bring some information from Beverly Hutchinson McNeff. And she says, there is no limit to the power of a son of God, daughter of God, person, individual, humankind, but he or she can limit the expression of his or her power as much as he or she chooses. So in the God realm, we are infinite power. We are limitless at what we can create. It is only us who stand in our own way. It is only us who sees obstacles, that it, we are not transparent in our own lives to claim all the goodness that is already available to us. If we are making a decision from fear or lack, we realize we are edging God out. Then it becomes our choice, with God or without God. On this little piece of paper, I put, how does it feel practicing the presence of God? And you might say, well, what does she mean? So change the word God to love. This next year might be a little challenging for some of us in Florida, in this nation. So how do we see it with love? How do we hold ourselves and everything around us in a spirit practicing the presence of God? It is amazing how often we have tried to run our own show only to find that when we let God in, the show not only runs more smoothly, but practically runs itself. Have you ever completely surrendered? You think you got it. You know everything, because I know you know everything, but your way ain't working. So what happens when you just take a breath? Come on, take a breath with me. And release. Yeah. Wow. Wasn't that a sense of relief that you don't have to be in control all the time. If you want understanding and enlightenment, you will learn it because your decision to learn is the decision to listen to the teacher. We talk about Jesus as our teacher, our way shower, our example, and all that Jesus knew and had within is also already within us. So the decision to listen to the teacher who knows light and therefore can teach it to you. I will say that we reawaken to that God consciousness that we're already a part of. Sometimes we just have to remember to turn our light on, right? Just remember we are that circuit of the divine, and it's up to us to tap in. The decisions we make at the center, she says, are effortless, not because they're always easy, but because they are made by releasing to the strength of God. How would that feel if in this next 24 months or less, as we're beginning to look at what is happening around our new building, 
If we release and remember, it's a God job. It is a God job. For thereby miracles happen that we can't even see in our own mindset. I'm ready for the county to get a miracle. Do I hear an amen? amen? So when Marilyn took us on that little journey, did you go back to when you learned how to ride your bike? I did. Denver, Colorado. In the garage with mom's car on one side, dad's car on the other, me on that bicycle, that lone wolf, like much of life, beating up that cars back and forth <laughs> as I learned to ride that bike. And eventually, coming out of that garage, super child, on the bike, a little wobbly. My dad was out there, and we were like in a townhome complex, and I can remember going downhill <laughs> and not knowing where the brakes were. And dad goes, brake, brake! And the brick wall went, stop! <laughs> and that was a true story. So yeah, thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> but isn't life kind of like that, right? If we don't have bumpers, maybe if we're not prayed up, if we're not understanding the God that is in and through each one of us, we the wild children going downhill without brakes. We don't have any side bumpers helping us out. We're not sure anybody's around. We're just pushing our own agenda, forgetting that we're part of the greater good. A collective consciousness a universal flow that says, I've got your back. I'm here for you. For everything we do here at Unity of Palm Harbor, it's not just any one individual. When we have beautiful designs and dreams that come through, Darlene and Bridget and our other teachers are often at the helm saying, what can we do magnificently to bring joy and excitement in our youth program? So the children will want to be here. So they'll want to know how they can grow and expand and contribute back to our home community. And then we have our ambassadors and our ushers, our AV team. No one person makes this place run. Our office that supports us. Our sound ministry. If you have not been here on a Wednesday night, I invite you to come, 7 o'clock, bring your yoga mat, bring your pillow, bring something heavy over your eyes, and just know you're coming to let go of everything in the universe and that you're able to be fully supported in a safe environment. And then you'll have beautiful facilitators like Greg Aiken, Deborah Laron. Gabriel Nelson, and they will take you on a journey, that midweek journey that interrupts, pattern interrupt us of all the chaos, of all the normal everyday routine, that you get an opportunity to replenish your spirit. And we hope you do that more often here than not, more often than not. So I quoted Eric Butterworth when I looked at what I wanted to create for the service today. And if you've never read Discover the Power Within You, it's one of my favorite Butterworth books. Now, for those who don't know who he is, he's a legendary minister in the Unity Movement. He had a big church, I believe, in the, the New York area and also in the Detroit area. But his words are easy to hear. It isn't some gigantic intellectual philosophical thing that you're like, what? Is he talking about? This is someone who sincerely wanted to bring the unity message forward. So I quote him, I may say that I have had a lot of injustices in my life, but the point is, we must begin to acknowledge not what is wrong out there, but where am I in my own level of consciousness? Where am I in my own level of consciousness to know that our consciousness, consciousness not only makes our life what it is, it's our perception, our information that we take in based on our childhood, our teachings, our, our churches, our friends. It's our information we take in and we have permission to change our thoughts if that's not working for us. 
So he says, where am I in my level of consciousness to know that our consciousness not only makes our life what it is, but this level of consciousness can be changed? That's what we're going to be exploring in our seven-week program. I had to look at the word consciousness. Some people like to equate that with mindfulness. And I think that's a little different. If we were in the Buddhist practice and we were talking about mindfulness, I think it's a little bit different than when unity is referring to consciousness. And it's defined metaphysically as the sense of awareness or knowing. So my question might be to you, and I'm very guilty of this, how unconscious are we in our everyday life? Have you ever driven to the grocery store and maybe you remember the turns, maybe you remember the light, but you arrive there and you have no idea how you got there? <laughs> there is a little children's um, song at Christmas time, and the horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. So how many times has your horse carried your sleigh and you have no idea how you got there? Because you're just unconsciously going through life. Our invitation is to set an intention. Our invitation, like that little piece of paper that we handed out, is to consciously be awake. To set our intention how we want to create our lives going forward. That we're not blindly being led, but that we are intentionally spirit-fed. That we include in our daily decisions, and those crazy other people driving on 19, <laughs> that we know how to do this with grace. Because at the end of the day, what we create, what we filter, what we take in is our own perception. And if we allow people outside of us to cause upset, unease, we've just given our power away. And we are powerful beings. We are powerful spiritual beings. So if I were to ask you, to really think for a moment of something or someone that is just driving you crazy. Can you imagine somebody right away? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I heard. Great. That was Marilyn's enthusiasm. I am ready. I am bringing forth that person right here right now and I can put that heart in front of them, Reverend Tracy, and I'm still irritated with them. And sometimes in unity we say, oh, that's all about the mirror. Whatever is not healed in you is showing up in them. Well, you know, pfft. Okay, sometimes that's true. <laughs> and sometimes they're just on their own journey and you're a catalyst to help make it happen. So my suggestion today, bringing in the image of that person that is driving you crazy, what if we shifted our consciousness around that? That we didn't give them the power to drive us crazy. Instead, what if we looked at them, as Eric Butterworth said, you have the perfect right to be angry at some injustice in your life. And you have the perfect right to that rapid heartbeat and indigestion that follows it. So as we think about things, the energy follows our thoughts. That's a basic unity principle. That's the law of cause and effect. So as we are looking or imagining that person that is driving us nuts, are you in a kumbaya position? Is there harmony and gentleness? Are you breathing with ease? Are you getting a little hot and heated? What are you giving away? Did you forget the same God loves you, oh, loves them? So how do we open our mind and switch our thoughts? Eric Butterworth says, you have a responsibility to yourself as well as divine law to keep yourself inwardly poised. That sounds like we have to be responsible for our thoughts. <laughs> One of the basic unity teachings Myrtle Fillmore shares with us, Eric Butterworth shares with us, discipline your thoughts. You don't get the opportunity in unity to say, Oh, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Why do you think that's true? 
We don't believe in the devil as some little guy with a pitchfork and some horns and a tail. What we might believe the devil to be is your thoughts that hold you back from your greatest good. That you allow something outside of you to dictate to you how you're going to be. You are allowing something outside of you that is not the God within you to disrupt you and you're giving your power away. If you discipline your thoughts, if you take your focus into a direction of the life you want to create, then the energy is going to flow behind it. It sounds so easy. Do you think it's easy? No, no. No one said that new thought thinking is easy. It's old, it's ancient practices. People use this in the healing arts. We use it when we talk to a small child who's reaching up to make that basket. And we say, imagine you, this powerful co-creator with the universe, can make that shot. And they practice. And they practice. And hopefully someone in your life was behind you saying, you can do this. Because some of us had to hit a few brick walls first before we learned we can do this. And at the same time, there's an argument that children, especially in the elementary age, cannot really see the difference between reality and that which is not reality. So when they're playing those war games, there could be a thought, well, you never know if we go to war, those kids will be psyched into it, we're prepared God knows our millennials have been in war ever since they were born. But the other thought is they can't differentiate. So they don't know the power that something outside of them has grabbed a hold of them and now they become desensitized. So we can use this power for good as in creating what we want to create or we can use this power to destroy ourselves. It's our mindset. It is our consciousness. It is our awareness. So what do you want that to look like? Because when I heard the word discipline, that doesn't sound like fun. What is your image in your mind? Throw it at me. Discipline. Military. Military. Anybody get a switch growing up? Anybody get the back end of a belt growing up? Anybody get put in a corner all by yourself? You couldn't talk to anybody? That one worked with my son. I probably need to pay for his counseling. <laughs> but some people don't like to be taken outside of the group. I like to be with groups. I like to be alone. So when we think of discipline, what if it was mindfulness, consciousness, awareness ourselves of where are my thoughts? Anytime. Where are my thoughts? Are they creating or destroying my peace? When we talk about the way shower, the teacher, the Christ, everything he demonstrated, he said it's already within you. All you have to do is be aware, alert, awakened. These things I do, you can do and more. And sometimes we forget because we just got cut off in traffic. Something happened to disrupt our peace. Sometimes that anger, I would say, is not always destructive anger. When I get a little lazy, which is not very typical of my personality, but when I sit back a little bit, because I'm not sure that's not typical of my personality either, but sometimes that anger spurs me forward. Is there something I need to get off my butt and start doing that I have been reluctant to do? For some people, it might be as easy as cleaning out all that 23 years of stuff that's been living in your house that you've never touched again. Maybe it's that storage facility. Maybe you are now outraged by things you are witnessing in the world and you have not taken a stand. There was a book you were going to write. There was an iPod you were going to cast. There was a piece of art that you want the world to see. And someone told you you can't do it. So when, do the, when does anger actually spur us forward, but in a highly creative, demonstrative way? 
not a way that is fearsome, but in a way that shakes us up to get on task. Because I think we know what we're supposed to be doing. And if you don't, Marilyn has a great class called The Purpose Driven, or something close to that. <laughs> and we'll do it again until we get our messages, until we acknowledge them, until we love that person that we are meant to be as we are demonstrated in this life path. Don't be lazy. One person we were talking this past week, and life changes form. Change isn't always comfortable. But for those of us who were living, be alive. Grab it. Be all that you can possibly be. Live life fully today. Now, if you ask my father about that, he's one of those probably saved the first nickel he ever made. I believe in the universal flow. My daughter says, my God, you can't turn it around fast enough. That doesn't make some people happy. Not bothering me. You can't take it with you. So you have choice. You're always at choice. Everything that you create, you are at choice. Eric Butterworth says, change the thoughts and you change the whole experience. That's another basic unity teaching. If you don't like what's going on and appearing before you in your world, what do you have the power to do? Change it. And how do you change it? You are good students. Everybody gets an A. The other side I love, oh, okay, I want to show this part. In disciplining your thoughts, we know the commandment reads, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And when Jesus came to share the teachings with us, what did he say? Louder? And if you even think about coveting these things, you've already done it. If you even think the thoughts as the child with the basketball, as the kids playing the war games, that emotional realm, that spirit-fed realm has already experienced it. We call it affirmative prayer. So the mountain shall move. If you believe it will move, it will have already been done. So how do we surround ourselves in these thoughts of what we want to create? How do we keep ourselves in alignment with what we want to create, not what we don't want to create? And the second part of that is practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. Eric Butterworth said, Righteousness to Jesus meant the actual practice and thought of one's essential spiritual unity with God. It is the right use of spiritual law to practice the presence of God. What does that even mean? What if you took out the word God and put love? Practice the presence of love. When something is tense, uncomfortable, could you change in your thought pattern by looking at it in the eyes of love? Could there be a compassionate side to you that recognizes you don't know what that person's been through today? You don't know that a loved one lay in a hospital bed had the fourth or fifth stroke, cannot get oxygen to fill the lungs, can't remember anybody around this person. And a loved one is there saying, let my loved one go, do not resuscitate. And then that person you meet, and you don't know what they've been through, you have no inkling of an idea why they cut you off in traffic why they're sad, why they don't want to show up with smiles. And it's up to us to see people differently, to hold that compassionate, nonviolent communication, that God light, to see beyond what is right in front of us, but just to imagine we are powerful co-creators. We have amazing imaginations. We can create bad, so let's take the whole thing and shift 
our consciousness, that we can see the light in that person when they cannot hold it for themselves. We have no idea how that child grew up. We have no idea why they acted out the way they did. There's not an excuse. And if you've ever had to call boundaries, it's not an excuse. But can you look at them in the eyes of God? It's a discipline in the eyes of love. Can you forgive those that have wronged you that you think have wronged you? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yes, you could be talking about money, but you could be talking about those people that you think have caused you harm. So what would it be like if every day you arose to the occasion and said, today I'm practicing the presence of God? Can we affirm it together? Today, I'm practicing the presence of God. Today, I am the presence of God. Today, I am the presence of God. Today, I am the practice of love. Today, I am the practice of love. Do it again enthusiastically. Today, I am the practice of love. Do you feel the vibration? It can shift your consciousness. We're carrying some cobwebs back there. It's a really good thing we got all Hallow's Eve coming up because we can dress ferociously and get rid of those demons and come into the new year after the day of the dead and let it go. That we can be that rising sun, S-U-N, S-O-N that's coming at Christmas. That we can hold the truth of who we are as that divine expression of love and discipline our thoughts so we can actually practice that presence of God seeing the truth of other people. So that when we have discussions, maybe not debates, but discussions about things that we don't all agree on, respectfully, maybe we can listen there might be some common ground, especially over the next 12 months. Especially over the next 12 months. So I love, I love, I love, I love. Here's Eric Butterworth. Perhaps we need from time to time to go out into our garden of accumulated knowledge of the truth and to break down the trellises and to rebuild them only as, and if they can, give support to the growth of the flowers of spiritual thought. Break down the old if we can create the new. So a trellis usually holds a vine. And we want the roses or the flowers or the spiritual ideas to be fruitful and multiply. Do we not? So sometimes we have to look at our old forms in our head, our constructs and say, thank you, God, for what we have known to be true. And thank you, love, for what we are practicing today. An opening, an awareness, a way of being that might be very different than we've ever done before. Especially when we have some concrete ideas. And I'm never going to move. This is the way it is. And... That trellis is ready to carry the new vines. So we can have the new flower, the new roses, the new building, the new people that are joining us. They don't even know it yet. Consciously send that invitation out there. Consciously, alive, alert, awake. Bring your friends. Come dress up in Halloween. Come play with our children. Step forward as leaders of our community. I bless you. I thank you, and remember, you are already the divine presence of God. Amen.